Everyone, what we want to talk about now is something called mutual inductance, or what we use them as, we use them as transformers. When we talk about a transformer, what we're saying is that we have one circuit with current going through it, and you could say that the, the end of the page on this side and out of the page on this side of the wire. So you have those loops of magnetic field, and those ma loops of magnetic field stretch out into circuit two. So as you turn on the circuit, what you can have is a change in flux through circuit two. So circuit two is gonna send its own magnetic field back in the opposite direction to try and cancel out the change in flux of circuit one, and it's gonna induce currents in the opposite direction. So here is our transformer. What we have is a primary coil or primary solenoid on one side of this piece of metal, and we have a secondary coil on the other side of this piece of metal. What we do is we have certain turns on each side. So let's say that the primary coil has 400 turns and the secondary coil has 200 turns. The primary coil is where we're going to induce the voltage. So if we send a current through the primary coil, it's going to change the flux and create a magnetic field right through the middle of coil one. Well, since it's attached to a piece of metal, the entire piece of metal becomes magnetized. And so when the piece of metal becomes magnetized, the secondary coil will sense that change in magnetic field. That means there'll be a change in magnetic flux. So it will also induce its own magnetic field in the opposite direction in, to try and resist that change in flux and to induce your own magnetic field, you've got to induce your own current. So a current comes out of the second coil just because of the changing magnetic flux of coil number one. And remember, according to Faraday's law, that induced voltage is d flux dt. Flux is the number of turns, the area, and the magnetic field. In this case, the area is not changing for either one of those coils, but what is changing is the magnetic field as let's say this primary coil is hooked up to a generator and we have alternating currents going back and forth in the primary coil. Well, if that change in flux is happening on the primary coil, the same dBdt is happening on the secondary coil. So that means we can set the change in magnetic field equal to both the primary and secondary coil. And since we said that the change in magnetic field and the areas were the same for both the primary and secondary coil, setting those equal to each other, we can get that the voltage in the primary coil over the number of turns in the primary coil equals the voltage in the secondary coil over the number of turns in the secondary coil. So like we said, that the primary coil had 400 turns and the secondary coil has 200 turns. Well, let's say that the primary voltage there was 120 volt. That means that the secondary voltage comes out to 60 volts to keep that ratio the same. So what we call this is a step down transformer. We went from a coil that had lots of turns and when it induced currents in the secondary coil that had less turns, the voltage went down from 120 to 60 volts. And this is kind of what happens from the power lines to your house. The power lines are at a potential of maybe 5,000 volts, but in your house, you use 120 volts of AC voltage when you plug something in. So that means there's a step down transformer right near your house that's gonna take that high voltage from the power line and transform it into a low 120 volts that you can use. Now 120 is what's coming in from the wall, but when I go to charge my phone or some of these other devices, they don't need 120 volts. So you always notice that on the ends of your chargers, there's a little box. That little box is another step down transformer. It steps the voltage from 120 volts down to a lower voltage that can recharge your battery. We can do the same thing in reverse. If I make the secondary coil more turns than the primary coil, we can have what we call a step up transformer. And this is how we get high voltage transmissions from power plants. They generate high voltages in the power plants and then send it out to a step up transformer. That'll send it out to those very large power lines that go across the country and we send very, very high voltages across those lines. They get down to substations when we get closer to cities that step down the voltage to what we transmit through the cities, like we said, maybe 5,000 volts, and then step down again once we get into your house. So this is the purpose of 
mutual inductance, and a transformer to change voltage and distribute power be easily and efficiently. But how do we get that changing magnetic field? And how do we get that alternating current? Well, we said we could hook it up to a generator or we could hook it up to something we call a tank circuit or the LC circuit that we looked at in the FET demonstration. These are resonant devices that make charges move back and forth at particular frequencies. The LC means we're dealing with an inductor and a capacitor. They're gonna share the amount of energy the charge flow pushes charge into the inductor and then that energy shifts back and forth between the two devices as we watch it go back and forth. So on the clip here, you can see that I am charging the capacitor to its five volt max and I'm hooked up to an inductor on the other side. Let's draw out each of the steps in the scenario as we go along and we'll watch what happens in the capacitor and in the inductor. So here we are at the beginning with a charge capacitor and an inductor that has no current flowing through it. So in the beginning, a charge capacitor does not want to stay charged if it has a chance to send charges from high voltage all the way to low voltage. Remember, an inductor is just a wire, so it allows for that path for the capacitor to discharge. So when it discharges, that means the capacitor is going to start sending current through the inductor. But the inductor initially has no flux, so it acts like that infinite resistor and tries to resist the change in flux. So right off the beginning, you can say that all the energy is sitting in the capacitor in terms of one half Q squared over C. So all that electric potential energy is now moving into current and the currents are gonna start pushing charges through the coil. As more time passes, the capacitor becomes less and less charged as the current is growing in the inductor. The inductor is now getting used to magnetic flux through it and current is flowing until all the charges on the capacitor completely discharge. And at this point, now we are at maximum current. And since we're at maximum current, that means there's a very strong magnetic field that's set up in the inductor. The inductor is now used to this very, very strong magnetic field and the strong magnetic flux. So that being the case, all my energy transformed into magnetic energy in the form of 1 half Li squared. But now that the capacitor is fully discharged, there's nothing to provide current to the inductor. So the inductor is gonna use its potential energy to try and maintain the circuit. And in the next step, if we follow the flow of positive charge as the magnetic field starts to get weaker in the inductor, it's gonna push positive charges onto the bottom plate and negative charges onto the top plate. So as the inductor is losing its current, it's trying to maintain the circuit like it used to when the capacitor was giving a charge and the magnetic field is weakening and the capacitor is recharging. After a few more moments, the capacitor is fully charged again, just now in the opposite direction, and the magnetic field goes to zero. All the magnetic potential energy went back into electric potential energy in the capacitor. So if we were gonna graph the energy flow in this case, we could say there was no energy in the inductor in the beginning of the setup, and all the energy was in the capacitor. When we get to maximum current, the capacitor is fully discharged, and the inductor is running at maximum current. Now that we're at this point, the capacitor is charged in the opposite direction. But remember, it's Q squared over C, so it really doesn't matter that we are charged in the opposite direction. The capacitor is back to maximum energy, and the inductor is down to no energy since the current has died off and the capacitor is fully charged. So we've gone through about half of our cycle. But since the capacitor is fully charged again, it doesn't want to be fully charged if there's a path from high to low. And now there is, but that path sends current in the opposite direction, which the inductor will initially resist, but once the flux starts to grow, then a magnetic field will grow inside of the inductor. And as the B starts to increase, then the capacitor will start to discharge some of its excess charge, which will lead to the capacitor losing its energy and the inductor gaining potential energy in the form of current. And it'll eventually get to the point where there's no charge on the capacitor. The inductor has the strongest magnetic field it can possibly have, but now there's no reason for a current to flow. And since there's no reason for a current to flow, the inductor is going to try and keep the circuit going. And if it tries to keep the circuit going, as it loses its magnetic field, it's going to recharge the capacitor now in the opposite direction. So the capacitor is gonna gain energy again as the inductor starts to lose energy along the way. 
and then eventually the magnetic field is going to go back to zero and the capacitor is going to be fully charged. That means we've made one full cycle from positive plate being charged to the positive plate being charged again. And this will continue to happen as you can see here in the demo back and forth and back and forth many times. There's nothing to take the energy out of the circuit. And since there's nothing to take the energy out of a circuit, what could take the energy out would be putting a resistor in there. And all the resistance would do would cause some damping in this oscillation. It would oscillate back and forth, but the amplitudes would get weaker and weaker. So looking at the total potential energy, it's really the capacitor's energy plus the inductor's energy, which is one half Q squared over C plus one half L I squared. And if we want to say that the total energy is conserved in this setup, then we could say that our total energy adds up to zero. And like we did in the LC lab today, we could write a differential equation for the changing charge with respect to time. So what this differential equation tells us is that we have an oscillating system back and forth, back and forth, similar to a mass on a spring. The spring filled would be the capacitor at its full energy. The moving charges would be the mass at equilibrium, or in this case, the current at maximum through the inductor. And then when we hit the charge capacitor again, the spring has compressed in the opposite direction. And before we talked about the angular frequency or how quickly this oscillates back and forth in respects to a mass and a spring as K over M. What we found in the lab today was that it is actually one over L times C. So the inductance times the capacitance, one divided by that value square root will give you the angular frequency of this oscillation. Once we know angular frequency, we can remember that omega is 2 pi over the time period, or you could write it as 2 pi times the frequency. So what this will create is a tank circuit that oscillates back and forth with a changing magnetic field in one direction, and then as the capacitor recharges and discharges again, and it'll change the magnetic field down in the opposite direction. And in terms of our transformer, this is how the primary coil could have a changing magnetic field up and down, which are put near a secondary coil and cause the same change in flux in the secondary coil. When the secondary coil senses that change in magnetic flux, due to the tank circuit on the left, it will induce voltages and currents in the secondary coil, whether it's a step up or a step down transformer. So that is the end of electromagnetic induction. We've talked about many, many different circuits and pieces to put into your circuitry based on magnetic fields and changing magnetic flux. There's one more person that we need to introduce to combine all of electricity and magnetism into one unified form. And we'll talk about that one next time.